Hi guys, how are you? Are you excited to be here? I need to hear a, a loud yes. Because yeah. I came from Chicago, I need y'all to be excited to be here, okay? <laughs> um, we're just getting the presentation started, but the theme of this entire sort of segment, this keynote is boss up. And what does that mean? That means to be forthright, forthcoming, to actually take that initiative, that next step in your career. So throughout this entire keynote speech, throughout this segment, I'm going to give you guys tips, tricks, and different um, advice from my perspective on how to make it to that level. So this is an open forum. I don't want you guys to think that I'm a professor. I'm not, I'm not a teacher. I've actually been in your place in some way, shape, or form. So please, 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 at the end of this, ask me any question you want. No question is a bad question or a horrible question. I'll gladly answer it with my honest opinion, honestly. So without further ado, OK, great. So oh, great. Can you, hello? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Great. Is that OK? Is that OK for you guys? Cool. OK, um, great. So again, my name is Delicia. I spent all four years of my college career with LIM. Um, from undergrad all the way through graduation, and I had the pleasure of having multiple internships during my stint here as well with Seventeen Magazine, Hermes of Paris, and BCBG Max Azria. Thereafter, after my graduation, I had the likes of working with and publishing with GQ Magazine, Men's Health, and now most recently Live Nation. So I have about a six to seven year sort of career in marketing and events. I've always wanted to do marketing and events. That's always been a passion point of mine. But honestly, when I first started, I thought I wanted to be a stylist. But then I realized there's number crunching in that. And I thought, no, that's not for me. So let's like carry on with that. So here's the rundown of what I'm going to discuss with you guys today. These are basically my five pillars of success in terms of not only landing a position, but actually taking the next step in your career as well. So these are the tools, the tips, the tricks that you can learn on how to progress in the actual industry and what not to do as well, because you'll find that a lot too. So I encourage everybody to take notes. And again, after this, feel free to ask me anything that you want. So the first up is the new business of fashion. We as millennials have a pretty harsh sort of um, stigma in the industry. So I'm going to tell you what to do and what not to do in the industry in itself. The next is show me the money, salary, revenue, that's all big to us. So. Show me the money is the way for me to articulate to you of how to ask, negotiate, and solidify that, that uh, revenue, that salary that you're looking for. That's what she said is workplace confrontation with your supervisor, your colleagues, your coworkers. I've had a fair share of mine, trust me. So I can tell you how to manage workplace confrontation and how to overcome conflict in itself. The next is Minority Report. I myself, clearly a minority woman, um, used to being so in the corporate environment. So I'll take you through, if you are a minority woman, LGBTQ, Asian, Latina, African American, how to deal with that sort of, um, that sort of stigma in the workplace and how to overcome it. And check yourself, unique ways to stand out. When you're in the workforce, you're sometimes considered like a needle in the haystack. You guys are entry level professionals, so you're up against a lot. So this will show you how to actually stand out amongst the crowd. So the new business of fashion. These are my do-dos, what you should do in the actual industry. Again, we are all millennials, right? We're the next level of professionals that will hit the industry while the baby boomers sort of you know, fall off a little bit. So um, in the industry, millennials have a bad rap. We really do. We're known as being uh, too lazy, entitled, unfocused, things of that nature. So uh, we already have that stigma in the industry. And these are, what you, these are items that you, or things that you can do to overcome that stereotype. First is take the initiative. Don't wait for someone to ask you to do a task. Actually be forthright and forthcoming on doing something in itself. You shouldn't have to wait for your boss to ask you, hey, pull up that document for me. Hey, do you have that file? You know, take the actual steps in doing so before that question is asked of you. And you'll see that that does stand out in a professional's mindset. The next is think, research, ask. 
So we're in an age where social media, technology, things of that nature are at our fingertips, so we don't really have to put in the actual willpower and know-how to actually look for information. Like, do we read books anymore? No, Siri can tell us. Like, we have Google at our fingertips, so what's the point of really putting in the work to research things? But if ever there's a question asked of you, think about it and process it first. What is she asking of me? Do I have this readily available? Can I find this file online? Can I find it from another colleague at my workplace? Instead of saying I cannot do it at all, just say I'll find that out. We never want to put any sort of stigma in someone's mind that we're not capable. <clears throat> the next is research. If you can't find what you're looking for readily available, we have Google. Like we, Google will tell us anything that we want. If there's something in Excel that I can't find out myself, I Google it. <laughs> if there's something in PowerPoint that I don't know how to do, I Google it. Like there's no reason, there's no excuse for us not to use those resources that we have readily available. And then last is ask. If all else fails, then that's when you ask whomever your supervisor is, whoever your colleague is, can you help me find this? But these are just the steps that you should take when someone asks you a question instead of automatically assuming that you don't know the answer at all. Just take the steps to trying to figure it out before you write it off. Your boss will always give you 20% information. It's your duty to flip that 20% into 80% of an answer, if that makes any sense. Next is ask for feedback. You need to get good at asking, what are my weaknesses? We all love to be told what we're good at. Hey, Delisha, you're doing well. That was a beautiful event. But honestly, you need to get good at what are my weaknesses. You need to get great at asking for creative criticism and creative feedback. Sometimes getting negative feedback sometimes can come across as you're doing something wrong, you're not good enough, trust me. I felt like that myself in the industry as well. But think about it this way. It takes someone more energy to tell you what you're doing wrong than it does for them to tell you that you're doing OK. Because if they're telling you to your face that you're doing OK when you're not, best believe they're talking about you behind your back. So you'd rather them tell you up front, right, so that you can correct the process. And I'll give you a good example of that. During Fashion Week, we had a new employee. We'll call her Molly. <laughs> Molly came dressed with spaghetti strap, black dress, very short, so if she bent over, you could see her stuff fall out. And no one told her what the dress code was. So she's walking around Fashion Week thinking she's doing it, thinking she's hot, and she wasn't. So <laughs> no one told her that she was dressed inappropriately, no one. And as soon as she left the room, everyone talked about her, heckled her. It's the fashion industry, so you'll get that sometimes. So I felt compelled to go to her and pull her to the side and just give her the lays of the law. Like the dress code here is all black fashions, but to the knee, like dresses and something that covers your arms. And she was so distraught. Like she couldn't believe that people thought of, thought of her like that. She couldn't believe that nobody told her. She couldn't believe that somebody thought negatively of her and this was her first week on the job. So again, it's better to hear that negative feedback up front and fix it versus getting a slap on the, uh, a pat on the back for an okay. So learn from any negative feedback that you do, that does come your way. Next is get it in writing. And I am, I live by this. So if, if ever you're handling a business meeting, you have a conference call, get everything that's said to you in writing, which means that if ever you have an agreement, if ever you confirm an event plan, next steps, you want to get anything that was promised in writing so that you have a paper trail of what was said. You'll find in the industry that people get forgetful. Some people will say, I never heard that, you never told me that. Those things were never discussed, which is why you want it in writing. You want your receipts, right? You want it in writing to let them know that this was talked about. So if ever you're with, in partnership with a vendor, make a contract. If ever you have a conference call, Always do a follow-up status report of what was discussed on that call, sending it to everyone that was, in, that was on that meeting. Just to have a paper trail of what was discussed so that you can always go back to it if you're backed in the corner. Trust me, that'll come up a lot. Next is own your own craft. We in our own right have things that we're passionate about, that we love, that we're interested in, 
but we always have to remember that everyone, everyone in this room, learning is limitless, Lear learning is ageless. You'll continue to learn until the day you rest, right? Like Oprah, for example, Oprah made a good point that she loves surrounding herself with young creatives that gives her, that fuels her creativity herself, that gives her ideas for new business ventures and new outlets. Shonda Rhimes, the creator of How to Get Away with Murder and um, Grey's Anatomy, she also surrounds herself with new fresh talent for new uh, different types of shows and different storylines. So you see these mega million tycoons, these media tycoons, they're always learning, they're always evolving. Never get complacent in your expertise because when you do that, that's when you, that'll lead to failure. And last is work-life balance. Now, when I was working during Fashion Week at IMG, I'd go into the office at 9 a.m. and wouldn't leave until midnight most of the times working on fashion shows. But you need to remember that you have to take time for yourself. As much, as much energy you put into your work life, you have to do into your mind, your body, and your spirit, because that'll fuel your energy and your creativity as well. So if you have to go off for 30 minutes and take a lunch break, if you have to go to that yoga class at 6 p.m., do so. And that's OK. That's OK to take a little time for yourself. It's OK to step away and just take time for yourself. And I understand that we'll have projects with deadlines, but you have to equally put time into your own mental stability as you do into your actual career. And now is the don'ts. So I have a really good uh, testimony about this and working with millennials and how we have the bad stigma. I used to work with a junior associate. We'll call her Sarah. <laughs> so Sarah had a reputation around the office for playing Candy Crush every day. I kid you not. She played Candy Crush all the time. She shopped online for clothing. She barely did any work or in between her projects, she would take her leisure time to shop online. And a couple months later, the company was giving layoffs. And uh, Sarah's job was one of those that got cut. She made it known around the office that she was not happy. She told her supervisor, who was her boss, she told her colleagues, her coworkers, such as me, that she was not happy at all. She was not excited that she got laid off. She can't believe it. She doesn't know why these other girls are working here, so on and so forth. Cut to a couple weeks later, Sarah had two interviews with Marie Claire and with Elle magazine, two top fashion books in the world. She got to the point where she needed professional references, right? And she listed her professional references as her boss, who she was complaining to, and one of her supervisors, her colleagues, who worked in the office with us. And of course, her professional references mentioned how unprofessional she is, how she's not put together, how she doesn't take initiative, she isn't proactive, and lo and behold, she didn't get either job with Marie Claire or Elle. Like, this is a true story. I'm not making it up. So, <laughs> so that's an example of you need to just articulate yourself in a certain fashion in the workplace in itself. One, no, no phone zone, no cell phones. Like, I know we're all addicted to them. Some of us right now, I see y'all. So, <laughs> so I know we're addicted to our cell phones, but studies show that we have an endorphin in our brains that if ever we get a text message or a social media alert, we automatically get a spark of happiness in our brains. So if ever we get a message, we automatically have to jump on top of it. We have to see it. We have to read it. And um, that distraction can cause distraction in the workplace. I'm, trust me, I am, a, I follow that myself. Like, I can answer emails at my desk, but I have my phone next, next to me, and as soon as my boyfriend texts, I'm like all over it, right? But if you really want to make a name for yourself in a position, and especially if you're entry level, you want to put your phone away for at least an hour or two to really get your job done. I do it all the time, I'm still trying to talk myself through it, but it'll definitely help down the long run. Tardy for the party, which is basically how it's read. It's like you want to be on time. At LIM, they tell you if you're on time, you're late, and if you're late, you're on time. I know you, you guys have heard that a lot before, and it still rings true. If you're a part of a meeting, if you're spearheading a meeting, 
There's no reason why you should be late to that meeting. I see it happen every day. If you're supposed to be somewhere across town or in a different building and you're running late or you're behind or you call into a meeting late, that's not acceptable because you are new and young professionals and you're supposed to be making a specific name for yourself. So you have to be on your P's and Q's as much as you can. Overshare, going back to Sarah, she was the queen of oversharing. Like she told us when she was hungover the day before, who she slept with, the day before that, it's like she, she always had a story for everything. And Sarah told too much. And again, whatever you share in confidence to some colleagues will most likely spread around the office and around the, and, the, the, and around the workplace. So be conscious of what you do say and how you articulate it to your colleagues because it can really come back around full circle. Sarah thought she could say whatever and do whatever, but we see how that came around to bite her in the end, right? And then the big ego, which us as millennials sometimes get a little jaded. We feel like we have expertise in a certain field and that we know it all, right? Like I'm a stylist, I styled a couple of C-list celebrities and I'm big, right? Or I did a couple of events here, six years and I'm that, right? But we should never let our ego or our expertise overshadow um, where we're trying to go. Again, there's always room for learning, right? So you can never think that you're too big for your britches, that uh, any job is too, too small for you. I don't want to staple those papers. I'm not an intern, right? I don't want to do that ex expense report. I'm not an assistant. No, there's no job that's too small for you. The senior vice president of Live Nation who works directly with me, she's in the trenches with me at events, unpacking boxes, putting, um, putting menus and picture frames and things of that nature. There's no job that's too small for her. There's damn sure no job too small for us. The SVP of the company makes a hell of a lot more than I do. And she's out there with me as well in the trenches. The next is underestimate your opportunities. And this is what I live by. If any of you guys have ever heard me talk here at LIM, you know this is something that I swear by. My first job out of college was, <coughs> it was at Prevention Magazine. And I'm sure most of you don't know what that is. You can find it at the checkout counter in your grocery store. Like prevention is for how a 75-year-old woman can get, get their groove back. Like it's not <laughs> something you're trying to read on a daily basis. So um, I was the marketing and events coordinator. And at, in that position, I traveled to San Diego, to Aspen, Colorado. I went to Philadelphia to plan a cocktail party. Like they actively let me travel with them to plan events marathons, dinners, galas, things of that nature. And I would have never thought so before. Now I've worked with luxury companies in the past. Nothing, no experience was as great and as fulfilling as that was. And I really think that was a great foundation for me to go off into other opportunities. Like you never know what that undesirable moment or that undesirable position will get you. Like never underestimate what's given to you. <coughs> because a position at that local paper can be more lucrative than being at, let's say, Tommy Hilfiger as an assistant. You never know what opportunities can come to you. So please don't ever underestimate what does come to you because it's happening for a reason. And the last is too codependent. <clears throat> and this goes back to um, the think, research, ask, right? You wanna be self-sufficient. Self-sufficiency is key, but and think that you can do what you can on your own, and don't try to rely too much on your colleagues and coworkers to get you to the next step and to get you to the next level. See, Sarah, the key person in all of my stories, she was, she was, a, she did that a lot herself. You know, she couldn't find a printer. Do you know where the printer is? It's actually around the corner. <laughs> What's the Wi-Fi? Well, if you click the Wi-Fi button, they'll tell you. Like. <laughs> Like, you know, just be a little more self-sufficient and that'll really take you a long way. So now that we've talked about how to articulate yourself within the workplace, we get to the good stuff. I hear the page is turning. Now everybody's really taking notes. I get it. Now we get to show me the money, how to negotiate salary, how to negotiate the pay rate that you're looking for and things of that nature. So whenever you negotiate salary, you have to keep in mind that you cannot act with fear. 
If salary negotiations is never something that's comfortable, it's always an uncomfortable moment. Even till this day, whenever I go to a new position and I have to negotiate salary, my hands get clammy, my heart starts to like pitter patter because I'm nervous, I really want it, right? And I don't want to ask for something that's too unreasonable. But you have to remember that at the bottom line, it's, it's your career, right? You're, you are your own brand. So you have to be confident in whatever you're asking for. And believe it or not, 50%, 57% of women do not ask for a raise at all. 57 of women, that's crazy. And only 29% of job seekers ask for a negotiated salary, only 29. That means the remaining job seekers are too afraid, like the rest of us, to really be upfront and ask what we're looking for, right? A lot of us are entry level positions, so we, we just want a job. So we'll take whatever they give us. But when, when you're going to that next level, that manager level, that coordinator, so on and so forth, you have to realize what's out there, what's in the market, what's competitive, and how that applies to you. The first one is come prepared. So with, whenever you try to negotiate a salary, you have to come prepared with your sales pitch. That's what the interview process is in whole. You're pitching to the company while you're the right fit for the position. It's like a sales sort of tool. Like if any of you get into sales, you'll realize it's the same thing. You're, you're pitching to them while you're the right fit, what you bring to the company and what you've done in the past will be beneficial to them. So come prepared with that pitch and with those reasonings. You have to come with an outline of what you bring to the table. What have you done in the past? Have you raised more revenue than the year before? Have you brought on new clients that you can bring to this new company? What are those ins and outs that are unique about you that you can bring to this new company you're applying for? After that, it's research. So it's a little hard when you're entry level to really be super competitive with your salary because there are a ton of you that have just graduated or a year or two into the job force and you are all going gunning for the same positions. So realistically, they'll take anything. But you need to research what's out on the market. So don't go in as a first time assistant looking to make $100,000 your first year. We would all love that, trust me, because I would too. But realistically, we can't make that you know, in the first run. So you, you should look at job sites like Indeed, LinkedIn Premium, which if you sign up for the premium version of LinkedIn, you can do it for free for like 30 days. I need to do a new one. <laughs> um, LinkedIn Premium or Glassdoor. They'll tell you what the competitive salary is for a job in the same category. For instance, if you're looking to be a marketing coordinator at a magazine, they'll show you relative um, salary ranges in that same field. So do your, do your research in that sense as well. You wanna make sure that you're looking at what that salary rate is and to keep that in mind when you're negotiating your salary. And last is speak up. This goes back to not having fear, right? Like you wanna be confident in what you say and don't be fearful of or afraid to go in and ask for a negotiated rate. If you know in your heart of hearts that this isn't a reasonable rate that you want, it's okay to say, hey, can we discuss something different or my salary range is a little bit more elevated, can we discuss that? There's no harm in speaking your mind. The next is don't leave empty handed. Now there's more that goes into uh, salary negotiations than just the salary. You also have to think about the benefits. And some of us, when you're the first you know, level in, who cares about benefits, I want the money. But no, you have to think about dental, healthcare, 401k, I know, 401k, and things of that nature. Do you get a corporate card for travel? the different benefits that actually come along with the position. I know that I was offered a job at a pretty good media company. And they were giving me the right salary rate, really good stock options and things of that nature, but they had horrible medical. They, didn't, they weren't providing a corporate card for my travel, and I'm an event, so I travel a lot. So that would have to come out of my pocket, and then they'd reimburse me. And they weren't giving certain perks that I was relative, that I'm familiar with getting at other positions. So I respectfully declined the offer. 
I knew in the long run that the benefits that I'm trying to build for my future didn't equate to the salary that they were trying to give me. So I respectfully declined. The next is kill them with kindness. Remember, you're talking about salary. So you can't go in there guns blazing saying, hey, I want this rate, and if you don't give it to me, I'm going to walk. They'll say, OK, we'll see you next time. <laughs> you have to be kind when you're asking for a specific salary. And you have to remember that being kind and just being gentle is the best way to go, right? God forbid you're super aggressive with your salary negotiations and you part ways with the company. I guarantee there's going to be another job with that same company that you'll want to apply for. And the HR manager, the recruiter, your um, future boss will remember that you were super aggressive in your negotiations. And believe it or not, the fashion industry isn't super huge. There are a lot of people that talk, a lot of people that have worked in the same companies. So that gets back around. So just be, just be careful about your wor word choice when you are talking to some of these companies and these talent managers. And last is don't be afraid to walk away. So you'll find a time that you probably won't meet or come, into the, come at a, a certain agreement on the salary that you expected. Maybe the benefits aren't what you thought they would be. And it's OK. If, they don't, if they're not bringing to the table what you're looking for, reasonably thinking, it's OK to walk away. Again, respectfully walk away. You can say, I respectfully decline that offer. Or at this time, I'm, I'm sorry, but those you know, expectations or requirements don't meet um, where I'm trying to go in the next steps of my career. It's OK to be, again, respectful with declining an, an offer. It won't bite you in the butt to respectfully decline something. <clears throat> now that we've briefly talked about salary, and I'm sure I'll get questions about that later, we'll go into um, workplace confrontation. Now again, you'll find this a couple of times. Sometimes you'll have a colleague or a coworker that you might not get along with, that you had a dispute with, or maybe just even miscommunication. But I'll give you some tips on how to articulate yourself in those situations and what to expect in the ex exchange and you know, how to combat that confrontation. So you'll find yourself in three scenarios. scenarios. I found myself in all three, probably four or five times. So you'll have a, a mis a disagreements with colleagues, so it's coworkers or a, a superior, so an executive, your boss, maybe somebody in the department or in a coinciding department that's an executive. And last is a client, so um, any vendors or uh, say like a caterer or uh, a creative, like a, a photo booth guy or a producer that you'll have just a minor dispute with. And these are ways that you can sort of handle the situation. One is recognize the problem. I had a, a boss in itself that she passive aggressively would say things to me in front of my colleagues. And she did it one time in a meeting. And I let it go. I'm like, OK, maybe it's just me. She did it another time, one on one, when it was just her and I. And then she did it for a third time in front of a big corporate meeting in a, with about 20 people. And at that point, I felt belittled. So at that point, I realized, OK, there's a problem here that I really have to face. Next is react with facts. We never want to react off of emotion. Now, trust me, I'm sure you will be in a situation where you think, if we were outside, it would be a different story. But <laughs> I'm at work. So I need to chill, right? <laughs> so you, you have to, don't react on emotion. You have to react intelligently and make sure that you have reasoning to back your argument. Because when you're trying to diffuse any sort of confrontation, you're going to find that people get defensive, right? Even us. Like if you're telling me something negative about me, I'm automatically going to get defensive and say, what are you talking about? That never happened. So you need to have, again, your receipts to back up why you feel um, the way that you do. Next is uh, three is acknowledge. So you have to acknowledge that there is a problem. I'm not saying sweep it un under the rug. There's no problem with um, dispelling any sort of confrontation. A lot of people don't like confrontation, and that's fine. But we as adults can handle it and articulate ourselves in a professional way. 
So acknowledge that there is a problem. So it's okay to pick your battles wisely, right? If it's a minor thing, again, in the beginning my boss passive aggressively said something to me one time and I dispelled it, but after the third time I knew that there was a greater issue. If it's something that's consistent and something that's weighing heavy on your heart, it's okay to bring it up and just to fuse the situation. And the fourth is resolve. So at this point, you want to resolve the confrontation. So with my boss specifically, I said, can I take some time to meet with you? I put time on her calendar. I took her out for coffee. You want to get away from the crime scene. You don't want to sit, you don't want to be there and actually talk out your differences. Took her out for coffee and let her know I'm having, I felt a little uh, uncomfortable in our last meeting. I want to know is, if there's something that I can do differently or if there is something that's making you feel uncomfortable. You kind of want to flip it and make it seem like you want to learn something from that experience. That's a professional way of handle, handling any conflict. It's sort of a reverse psychology thing. I don't want to trick you guys, but it is. <laughs> you want them to think that you're you have something to learn in the process and you want to make uh, the work environment easier for them. And that's a really great way to introduce or dispel or just to uh, come up, come into, com come um, interact with actual confrontation in itself. And then the last is to move forward. You're going to have the conversation then. Hey, I felt uncomfortable in that situation. Is there anything that I can do to make this environment a little bit more comfortable? Is there anything that I said that made you uncomfortable? You're going to have some sort of back and forth interaction about that. And you might agree to disagree, but whatever. It's then how do you move forward from that? What can you do for yourself to make that, those future situations better? Maybe you can say something different, do something different, or in the industry they, they say not to take it personal. Again, um, so it's whatever tips and tricks you can do to make the environment comfortable for the both of you or for all parties. Now that you've learned how to handle confrontation, let's talk about the really good good. <laughs> I hear more pages turning. <laughs> let's talk about the minority report. So again, I'm a minority in a major corporation, right? And um, for all of us that have worked with or are minorities, you'll find yourself in uh, situations where you need to want to work in a more diverse environment. They say that companies that have more diverse environments are 45% more successful. So diversity is key. It's different personalities, different people, different techniques that actually fuel creativity. So there's nothing wrong with that. But for some of us that are minorities in, ourself, in itself, it makes us sometimes feel uncomfortable. Like, how do we handle those situations? How do we integrate ourselves in, into those environments? Now, it's 83, the workforce of professional managers, professionals, and related fields were made up by 83% of Caucasians. 83% of the industry was made up by um, Caucasian workers, which is completely fine. But that just shows we have a long way to go in terms of diversity and making more diverse environments. <clears throat> that was in 2010. Cut to today, there's minorities make up about 32% of the workforce. That's inclusive of Latinos, African Americans, and Asians. 32%. That's insane. So for those of us that do work in um, a less diverse environment, or those of us that will potentially hire some more diverse candidates, these are some ways that you can handle the situation. First is hiring and promotion. If you guys ever come encounter with um, someone of a diverse background or field, be open-minded about integrating them into your company and into your, onto your team. That goes for entry-level positions, that goes for interns, that goes for upper-level management, be open to different sort of fields and backgrounds that you're hiring for. And that's not only just for the actual position entry level, but that's also for management positions and promotions as well. The next is organizations and policies. Think about creating specific organizations that do cater to different diverse backgrounds. At Live Nation, we have BEN, Black um, Employees Network. We also have WEN which is Women's Employees Network, and we have Kids Nation for the kids. 
So, so think about creating specific groups and organizations for your likes, like build with your likes, and that's okay. That's, those are great ways to actually make different diverse backgrounds feel like they have people that they can relate to and that they can actually um, feel integrated within the company in itself. At Ben, the Black Employee Network, we actually have different networking events, different events, um, different nonprofit sort of um, fundraisers that we put together. And we're building with the small group of black employees that we do have within the company and creating different um, regulations and rules to grow into the future. So that's what I like about the company that I work for now. They're open to diversity and really integrating different cultural groups into the actual organization. Next is policies. Don't be afraid to um, cater to and recognize specific holidays for different backgrounds as well. If there are Latino cultural um, holidays, if there is um, black or Asian holidays as well, don't be afraid to recognize those. We recognize Christmas, we recognize Halloween, right? So let's recognize the other cultural um, heritage months and days within the calendar year as well, that'll make us feel more included. And last is uh, handle with care. So diversity as a whole today, now more than ever, is a very, very touchy topic. One, it's something that we do need to talk about, but two, we need to be careful with how we actually touch base on it. Because it's very easy to fall into um, stereotypes and certain coll colloquialisms of different nationality, so we need to be very careful with how we handle those specific topics. And this is for people that are going to hire and promote in the workplace, and these are great tips on how you can handle diverse groups and new employees that are coming into the work field. Now, if you're an actual minority being in the work field, here are some uh, different things that you have to keep in mind yourself. One is bust the myths, the myths and misconceptions. Me specifically, I'm used to being the only black woman on a team of 20 or 30. That's just the nature of the game for me, and that's been everywhere that I've worked. And I come across frequent misconceptions of being angry or, uh, you know, the slang, like, hey girl, yes, yeah, all of that. I get that a lot, right? <laughs> So it's important for you to bust those myths and misconceptions. Like I'm more than the stereotypes that you see on TV or read in a book. Like I bring more to the table than what you assume. The next is um, get noticed regardless of office politics. In corporate America, you frequently find cliques, groups, your boss will have his or her favorites. You frequently find those specific sort of crowds. I don't like to call it the mean girl sort of syndrome, but it's sort of um, like high school in a sense that people have certain people that they gravitate to naturally, and um, your boss and or colleagues will have their favorite people that they connect with. That's fine, but it's up to you to show your, your employees and your coworkers why you're great, why you're great in that position that you're in. Sometimes, because we're of a different race, we automatically segregate ourselves. We want to be with just groups that are just like us. But you need to show those that you work with, that d diverse crowd, why you're right for the position that you're in. Whether it's from your work ethic, from your socialization, it's okay to socialize, be a little bit more outgoing. I know for me, when I was in the workforce, because I was one of my kind, I kind of closed up and shelled up. Like I, I didn't know what to say or how to articulate myself or how to even connect with someone that was outside of my race. So that automatically made me insecure. But it's okay to be open and to actually uh, connect with different people on different levels. Go out for a happy hour, right? Have a team luncheon. Do different things to actually connect with them and bust some of those stereotypes that they automatically have about your specific race. And the last is find a mentor. I think it's important to find a mentor that's of your race that actually has gone through what you have gone through as well, honestly. My mentor is my first boss. Her name is Siobhan Rains. She is now the event director at Pop Sugar. And um, she actually gave me my start. And she knows how it is through and through. She's a Harvard graduate, a very successful black woman, 
So I look to her as sort of like the blueprint of how I should articulate myself in the workforce and how I can propel my career as well. So these are just three minor tips on how you can maneuver in the industry in itself. And of course, there are more, there's more information and more things that you can learn from. But these are just three little um, nibbles or, or three snackable examples of, on how you can actually excel in the workforce as a minority in itself. Last but not least is check yourself. So again, we're in this, what seems like a really big industry. So I'm gonna give you tips on how you can stand out amongst the crowd, right? You're going, you guys are all going for possibly the same positions, so it's easy to become a needle in a haystack. The first is keep it punctual. And this goes back to what I mentioned before about being on time, not tardy for the party. So you really want to cross your T's and dot your I's with whatever you do. Like me, I'm notorious for following up on conversations or meetings with emails. If you go on an interview, follow up with a thank you email no later than one day after, articulating how you enjoyed meeting that hiring manager or that potential employer and saying how you appreciated them. If you're having a phone conversation with a vendor or whomever, making sure you follow up on those items. If you have a specific deadline for a project, staying on top of that project. If you know you're gonna be running late on that deadline, articulating to your supervisor, hey, I'm running a little bit behind. Making sure you communicate through and through what you're doing and how you're doing so that they're all, they know that you're on top of it. The next is support your team, you know? If you have an open window when you're not doing anything during the day, ask your teammate, is there something I can do to help you? Are you swamped? Is there anything that I can take off your plate? You wanna be a team player. You wanna show your team that, hey, I'm here to support you. We're a part of a team. There's no I in team, right? We're a part of a team for a specific reason. So what can I do to actually help you in this day? And if they don't have anything immediately, it's okay to take something off of their plate. Again, going back to being proactive, right? It's okay to actually take the initiative, again, in um, doing something to help those around you. Next is say it. So don't sit silent in meetings. I did this early on in my career. I was afraid to speak up. I had really great ideas, and I would shoot myself when somebody would say the same idea I had in my head before I could. Right, but they say that closed mouths don't get fed, right? So you have to, don't be afraid to speak your mind. Don't be afraid to voice a creative idea. Don't be afraid to ask a question because I guarantee someone else is thinking exactly what you are. And that also shows your employer or your boss that you're actually thinking about it, right? You're keeping it in mind. You're always keeping your wheels turning and you wanna, you wanna contribute something to the actual company in itself. So I don't think something like that can hurt you. Just being on top of things, asking questions, voicing your opinions, your ideas. You're actually showing that you wanna be a part of the actual team in itself. Next is be in it for the long run. Now, I was infamous for staying at a company for like a year and then I'm out, right? Like, <laughs> time to go, where's the next place that'll pay me more? But you wanna be in it for the long run. My boss has been with Live Nation for 15 years. 15 years. Like, to me, that's like ancient. Like, <laughs> like, that's a long time. But she's been there for so long, and look at her now. She's the SVP of the company at un under 40. No, over 40, that would be crazy. Um, <laughs> uh, over 40, and some people don't see a title like that under 50 or over 50, if you will. So it's okay to stay with the company for longer than, I'd say at least two years. That way you really actually soak up the knowledge of the position that you're in. If you're in a coordinator position or an assistant or a manager, you actually really know the ins and outs of that role and you can really take those tools to the next position that you do go to. So don't be in a rush to just bounce from place to place. It's okay to settle in and to really soak up the knowledge of the brand, of the history, of the heritage, of the company that you're working for, because that'll only help you in the future. And the last is build with new players. It's okay to interconnect with different departments. I'm in marketing, right? So I naturally liaise with the creative department, 
the legal team, accounting, because I need things paid and things of those nature. But it's okay to interact with different departments outside of your realm. Like I don't know anyone in ticketing, right? Or any of the stage production guys, the guys that actually put the stages together. And it's okay to rub shoulders with them. You never know where that communication, that connection, what, where those conversations will take you down the long run. Hey, I can talk to the stage production guy today. We can grow a good rapport at the company. Five years down the line, he may know someone at a different company that, I, that you know, could be a good shoe in that can get me a job. Or he may know someone at a different company that can get my friend a position. So you never know where that networking internally will take you. So don't be opposed to actually talking to, speaking with, building with different people within the company that you work for outside of your immediate team. And that's it, y'all. <laughs>